You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more... So huddled people. masses yearning to breathe Consider free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 21. We are coming to you this week from the Shawshank Redemption Studios, located on the campus of Holy Cross College in Worcester, Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook and Twitter, where my handle is, In the Past Lane. Keeping us honest and true is our executive producer, the one and only Lulu Spencer. Hey, Lulu, quick question. Lulu, hey, you in the booth. I'm ignoring you. Okay, duly noted. Perhaps later. Well, good people, we've done it. We've just hit our first anniversary as a podcast. All I can say is, wow. And thank you. I'm so grateful for all you loyal listeners and for the way you've helped spread the word about the In the Past Lane podcast. Each month, the number of listeners to this podcast has grown, and I owe it all to you. So thanks. So what's happening at In the Past Lane these days? Well, a new semester has begun here at the college where I work, Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. I'm teaching a course called Teddy Roosevelt's America, essentially a Gilded Age and Progressive Era course. Lots of fun. And I'm also teaching a seminar called The American Way of War. There's a lot to talk about in that one, as you can imagine. Things are looking good so far, but then again, I haven't collected any papers yet. I'm also getting ready for PodFest 2017. PodFest is an annual conference for podcasters, and this year it's in Orlando, Florida. So if you're a podcaster, or if you're thinking about jumping into podcasting, I highly recommend you attend this conference. You can learn more about it at podfest.us. That's P-O-D-F-E-S-T dot U-S. Okay, enough announcements. What's up for this episode of In the Past Lane? Well, our focus is on the history of incarceration. That's right, prisons and prisoners. In fact, it's such a huge topic, we're going to tackle it in two episodes. Just consider this one statistic. Right now, in 2017, there are 2.3 million Americans being held in U.S. prisons. That's more than any other country in the world. And as we'll see, mass incarceration is a relatively new phenomenon in American history. So to figure out how we got here, why we have so many people in prison, I take a trip to the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. It's a famous old prison that's been turned into a museum. It has a lot to tell us about the evolution of criminal justice in American history. Then, in our next episode, part two of our plunge into the history of prisons and criminal justice, we'll have a conversation with historian Elizabeth Hinton to talk about her book, From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America. It's a fascinating and honestly disturbing examination of how public policy since the 1960s has led to mass incarceration. Okay, people, let's hope we don't get pulled over for a broken taillight. Our journey in the past lane begins now. Why are so many Americans in prison? In 2017, the U.S. makes up 5% of the world's population. But we have 25% of the world's imprisoned population. That's more than Russia. That's more than China. More than any other individual nation in the world. In some ways, these stats are even more stark when we look at the number of people imprisoned per 100,000 citizens. This allows us to compare the United States to different-sized nations. 
What about Great Britain? They imprisoned about 145 people per 100,000 citizens. What about Canada? They imprisoned about 114 people per 100,000 citizens. And the United States of America? We imprison more than 700 people per 100,000 citizens. That's an incarceration rate five times the rate found in European Union countries. But here's the kicker. It's also about five times the historic rate of imprisonment in the United States. That's right. From the 1870s to the early 1970s, the U.S. imprisonment rate was about 150 people per 100,000. Right about the current rate in Canada and in Europe. So clearly something happened around 1970 that dramatically changed the criminal justice system in the United States. That story, good people, will be our focus in the next episode of In the Past Lane, part two of our exploration of the history of mass incarceration. But before that discussion, which focuses on the last 50 years of U.S. history, let's get some deep background on the history of prisons in America. To do that, I traveled to a remarkable historic site, Philadelphia's Eastern State Penitentiary. It's a famous prison built back in the 1820s that's now been turned into a museum. I spent an afternoon walking the site with Lauren Bennett, a veteran tour guide. As you'll hear Lauren tell it, the history of Eastern State reflects some of the most important changes in U.S. prison policy. Now, a couple of things before we get started. Lauren refers to the founders on several occasions. By this, she means the founders who created Eastern State as a model prison. Lauren also talks about the separate system. That's the original philosophy behind the prison, which was based on solitary confinement or keeping inmates as separate as possible. The other system Lauren mentions is the congregate system. This replaced the separate system in 1913. And just like it sounds, it allowed inmates to congregate rather than spend most of their time in isolation. Okay, on to the tour. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. Are you ready to roll? Sure. Okay, so uh, we're at the Eastern State Penitentiary, and I'm speaking to... Lauren Bennett. And you tour guide here? I am, yes. I'm a tour guide here at Eastern State Penitentiary. All right, and how long has this famous old prison been, how long has it been a museum open to the public on the scale that we're talking about right now? It opened as a museum in 1994. So can you just give me the thumbnail sketch history yeah. of the museum? Yeah, it was an active prison for 142 years. Started construction in 1822. Had its prison in May 1829. Uh, it was officially finished completion in 1836 with the seven original blocks. Active prison for 142 years, up until 1971 when it was shut down for good and abandoned for about 20 years after that. It's a remarkable run when you think about how American history has changed, but also how theories of imprisonment and incarceration and all have changed. So it's one of the things that makes this prison unique and historically significant is that it reflects kind of new thinking about imprisonment and you know the idea of a penitentiary. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So when Eastern State, when it was being conceptualized, it was during the period of enlightenment here in America, they were talking about prison reform. The founders of Eastern State were very heavily influenced by these Quaker ideals and each and every single person, there was goodness deep down. So they wanted to design a prison that could draw inner goodness out of people. So what they decided on doing is a system based on penitence, self-reflection, labor, and solitude. That's basically the separate system. It's a massive experiment, though. This had never really been done on this massive scale. It had been attempted a couple times in Europe previously, but nothing like nothing like this. So in turn, this is the first modern building in North America. They wanted to give inmates absolutely all the amenities provided for them, but they really wanted people to change while they were here. So it was a lot less about punishment, not really vindictive in its philosophy, but more about rehabilitation, about giving people who had run afoul of the law an opportunity to literally reflect and think on what they've done and kind of work their way back into society. Absolutely. The system for Eastern State was based on corporal punishment. So if someone commits a crime, they're going to get either branded or whipped for their crime. So it would be something of physical punishment. But the founders believed deep down if every single person was good, that was a little too harsh for people. So the separate system is designed to have a punishment and deterrent aspect. That's a solitary confinement. But the main thing that they wanted people to focus on was changing themselves while they were here. So when they left, they could be a reformed, changed person and be an active member of society. 
and the architecture itself reflects this. It's not just the philosophy of the place, but the architecture reflects mm-hmm. this new vision of giving inmates a, an opportunity to, to reflect, to work, you know, to, for it to be a positive space. So can you tell us while we're walking along here how the blocks themselves and the layout reflects this new idea? Yeah, absolutely. So the outside is designed to look like a castle, right? Fortress, like huge daunting walls. These walls are 30 feet high. Okay. So they designed the building to look scary and intimidating to scare people in Philadelphia to not commit crimes so they'd never be housed here. Now, the inside designed like a church or a cathedral. The seven original blocks all have high ceilings. They're all vaulted. Would have been a pristine white and there are over a thousand skylights here at Eastern State. And to really have inmates think and reflect and be inspired by the architecture to become better. And in some ways for it to be a healthy environment, too. There's not just dank and, you know, place where you just go and sit in the dark and contract tuberculosis and die. Yeah. A lot of the modern amenities that are provided here are for hygiene, right? So there is running water, there's flushable toilets, there are centralized heat as well. And because all the inmates were separated, when tuberculosis was a huge issue, it wouldn't have spread as quickly here because everyone was isolated. You're saying isolation, literally a single occupancy cell situation? Exactly. That was the original intent of the building was just to be one person per cell and they would just be occupying their own time while they were in there. Yeah, and I'm sure that changed over the years. By 1974, I'm guessing more than one person per cell. Exactly, yeah. As early as 1870, they had inmates living in cells together just purely because there was nowhere else to put people. Right. But by 1913 is when they officially decided it's not working anymore and it switches to a congregate system, how we think of prisons today. Yep. Inmates can eat together, live together, worship together, so on and so forth. So uh, what block are we in right now? We are in cell block two right now. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to very briefly describe the intake process of Eastern State. So when an inmate is pretty much sentenced to a time here at Eastern State, they receive a number to use instead of their name. They also receive a physical, making sure they're in okay health. They get a haircut and they also receive a bath, not only to cleanse them of their physical dirt, but like their metaphysical and Mm -hmm, spiritual mm -hmm. dirt. It's supposed to be like a makeshift baptism to get the person in the mindset of becoming a better person. They then have a hood placed over their head and they're escorted by a guard to this altar. And was the hood for security so they couldn't get a good view of the layout in case they tried to escape? Exactly. But the main most important reason was to protect their identity. And this is also why they are assigned a number instead of using their name. Because they were supposed to be a changed person while they were here, when they left, if they didn't want to talk about being in prison, they did not have to. Now, if you compare this today, this doesn't really happen Mm -hmm. anymore. If a person spends time in prison or in jail, they have to write that on their college applications and their job applications. But the founders really wanted to set people up for success. And ha- if they change themselves while they are in here, they should be able to be a different person on the outside as well. That's interesting because when you first think about the idea of a number, it sounds very impersonal, sounds very cold, sounds very bureaucratic. But you're telling a very different story, which is that it's actually a humanitarian mm-hmm. step to give them anonymity so that when they do get out, because the idea is that they will get out, that they won't be dogged by this bad mistake they made years ago. Exactly. Yeah, it's interesting. If you look at prisons today, there are still some lingering things of a penitentiary. So the, the, the number still exists today. Even the term penitentiary still exists. Now, if you break the word down, the root of it is penitence. And that's what was supposed to happen here. People right. were supposed to be humble. They were supposed to feel bad for what they did wrong. But in penitentiaries today, that's not so much the case anymore. It's more like a prison than an actual penitentiary. Yeah, more about punishment, more mm-hmm. about vindictiveness. In the last, say, 30 years, it's interesting. There's a lot that the history can teach us. Did they have education here? Yeah, that was the most important part. It was supposed to be prayer, self-reflection, and vocational training. So um, on the inside of the cell, every inmate would have a workstation. They can learn shoemaking, clothing mending, clothing weaving, cigar rolling. There's a greenhouse here on the property Mm -hmm. that inmates would learn how to grow flowers if they wanted to be a florist when they left. But that would be what they were doing all of the time. Every single day would be working on their trade. All right. So what's next? So if you want to step into a cell, all check right. it out. Let's do that. On the inside. It is, what would you say this is? 10? It's about 8 by 12. 8 by 12. Oh, and yeah. then a pretty high ceiling. Yeah. 20 feet? Yeah. And a skylight. And a skylight. Yeah. yeah. That was their main lighting source. Electricity is not introduced until 1889. So they were very dependent on these skylights. Very interesting. Yeah, I could see how the ideal of solitary confinement would come up against the reality that we now know so much more about, that it's really psychologically damaging and, and kind of runs counter to the idea of rehabilitation. Absolutely. However, the founders didn't want to believe that isolation was harming people. They would say if somebody developed some sort of mental health problem, they were either not working hard enough, not praying hard enough. Masturbation was a reason why people developed mental illness. Constipation was. Today, we know none of those things really cause mental illness. 
but they were really grasping at straws. Like if you were to read the physician's report, that's all the details of why somebody would maybe develop some sort of mental health issue in the system. Very interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of things in their infancy here. One is sort of professional, modern imprisonment and criminal justice and others, the medical profession is totally just becoming modernized, really doesn't have a great sense of, of the body, let alone the mind. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So uh, we're talking about policies and procedures and how that's very influential. Let's check out the architecture and see how the way the building is designed is very influential to prisons today, especially. So welcome to Eastern State on a busy Saturday. It is <laughs> so good, we're going to stand right crowd. here so we can see the whole facility. So in 1836, guards don't have a lot of technological advances of what they can work with. They have their eyes and they have their ears, right? So from where we're standing, we can see the entire prison facility in 1836. There would have only been seven cell blocks, uh, 450 cells at this point. So we can see all the way down one and then two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Just by spinning around. Right, so sort of like like the center of a wagon wheel, essentially. Exactly. This is a radial plan, and that's because all the cell blocks are radiating off one center point, exactly like a wagon wheel. Such an influential design, replicated 300 times all over the world, still active institutions that use this design today. But almost immediately, this idea of centralized surveillance breaks down. So you're going to notice one, two, and three all have single stories, and that was the original concept and design of the building. Halfway through construction, they have a lot more people coming in than they actually have space for. So four, five, six, and seven represent how they accommodate this. Two stories, the cell cell blocks are a little bit longer, but if we were guards standing here, we can't see that second story. And there's no equivalent to this on on the next flight up? Exactly. So almost immediately, that whole idea of what they wanted is breaking down. The same thing with the separate system. What looked great on paper did not translate into the real world, and it was starting to break down. You can see a lot of industrial thinking here, too. This is sort of when factories are being built, and the whole idea of monitoring, uh, you know, having a manager that can see everybody on the, on the shop floor and so forth, similar kind of thinking going into it. Yeah, and if you look at, like, the Panopticon and, like, Big Brother and things like that, it's very similar in design. Okay, let's take a short break. But don't go anywhere, people. Lauren Bennett is just getting started telling us about the fascinating history of the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia. We'll be right back. Yeah, right. That's the way it is. It's down there and I'm in here. I guess it comes down to a simple choice, really. Get busy living. Get busy dying. Get busy living or get busy dying. That's goddamn right. Classic lines from the classic film Shawshank Redemption. I could listen to that all day. If you are enjoying this podcast, then please subscribe to In the Past Lane at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access your podcasts. Subscribing is free, and once you do it, new episodes of In the Past Lane are automatically downloaded to your listening device. Subscribing also gives you access to the entire back catalog of In the Past Lane episodes. And if you do subscribe, please leave a review. Thanks. All right, let's pick things up with Lauren. Just before the break, she was telling us about how the architecture of the prison reflected the goals of the separate system. Now let's resume the tour at the point where prison officials decide to shift away from the separate system to the congregate system. All right, Lauren, take it away. So there are a lot of problems with the separate system, architectural limitations as far as like where to house every single person here with the main blaring problem that there was no proof that it works. So 1913 on the books is when the system stops. And over the course of time, things change dramatically. So which system is this? The The the, separate system. When they move into the congregate system, they start building uh, a kitchen for inmates to work in together, chapel for them to worship together. They're creating dining halls for inmates to eat together. Uh, So that's changing on the inside. Also, at the height of the overpopulation here at Eastern State, there's about uh, 1,800 people in 1931. So the goal of the system starts to change due to the fact that all that stuff's changing on the inside and Philadelphia, as you can see, is starting to grow up right next to the wall. 
So they are starting to really focus on punishment and separation rather than change and reflection and reform. So let's move out to the baseball field. Let's talk about the 20th century. Ah, the baseball field. (laughs) Yeah, not regulation size by any means. There used to be buildings here up until the 1950s. They knocked them down to open up the space for inmates to have a little bit more of recreational, larger recreational space. So you're going to see the backstop back here. And if you look on top of that wall, you're going to see this itty bitty little fence up there. And that is designed to prevent home run baseballs from popping up over. Kind of interesting, during the time period, like the 20th century especially, people on the outside of the wall start interacting with the present. So one of the things that starts happening is when home run balls pop up over the wall, little Philadelphia boys are taking those home run balls and trying to pop them back up over the 30-foot wall back into the present. And if they did it, it officially meant they were a man. But it wasn't just little Philadelphia boys that were doing that. It was also adults who were opening up those home run balls and filling them with secrets, notes, contraband, things that should not be in prison, tying them back up and throwing them up into the wall. That was the first thing that came to mind as I'm saying. <laughs> this is, seems like an ideal way to pass things back, back and forth from the wall. So, all right. So uh, did they, they must have monitored that as much as, as they humanly possible. One of the really interesting things about that is like as time is progressing, They're coming up with solutions to problems as the problems come up. So like originally there are no corner guard towers in the four corners of Eastern State and there's no visitation room either because inmates originally were not supposed to have visitors. So it wasn't until really problems started rising. Like in 1923, there was a ladder escape that happened here where inmates built a ladder, popped it up against the wall, and it was a huge blind spot for the guards. So as that stuff starts to happen, then they're like, oh, we have to accommodate for this. And then they start building more things to really help that out in that sense. But security is a huge issue in the 1920s and 30s, particularly tumultuous time here. After that 1923 escape attempt, the warden actually resigned because it was pretty embarrassing at that point. Big scandal, no doubt. So how many people escaped and did they all permanently get away or were they all sort of basically rounded up? So over the 142 years of history, there's over 100 escape attempts. Only one person that we know of never came back. Any way that you can picture escaping out of this building, inmates have tried over the wall, under the wall, walking right through the front gate. But that ladder escape attempt, that was one of the only inmates that we know of that never came back. His name was Leo Callahan. Him and a few other inmates escaped during that. And one inmate actually got as far as Honolulu, Hawaii, before he got recaptured and had to come back. But Leo Callahan, never seen or heard from ever again. But he'd be like 116 today, so I don't think we really have to worry about him. Right. So having a baseball field, what year was this put in, you said, in the 20th century? Yeah, so there were a couple different spots and locations where uh, originally the baseball field was actually over on the west side. This particular field is from the 1950s. But inmates could also play bocce ball. There's still an active bocce ball court there today if visitors want to play. There was basketball, volleyball, boxing. Lots and lots of different sports were played here. Additionally, inmates could take classes. They could take an art class, a music class. There was an Eastern State band that started here around the turn of the century. So lots of different options for inmates to supplement their time outside their cells. It sounds like it, it's a combination of things that at some point somebody's realizing that if inmates have something to do, mm-hmm. it makes for a better environment, more easier to control and so forth, but also maybe part of that rehabilitation process. Absolutely. I mean, around the turn of the century, the warden here was Warden McKenty. And he was quoted saying that a a time in prison shouldn't just be punitive, it should be educational. So that's when you really start to see a lot of those programs popping up. There's a problem with funding, though. So Eastern State doesn't have a whole lot of programming, but the programming that it does is really, really valued by the inmates. I can imagine it would. All right, so what else should we see? So we could check out cell block 15, the very last block that was built here at Eastern State. And then we can come back here and talk about contemporary corrections as well. Okay, this is cell block 15. This is the very last block to be built here at Eastern State. It was nicknamed Death Row, which is kind of a misnomer because there were no executions performed here. This is just where inmates were housed before they were transferred to receive their execution elsewhere. But this is also, if someone broke a rule, they'd be sent sent here. Now, in an era where inmates are living together in cells, playing baseball, working together communally, if an inmate is housed here, they are doing none of that. They're basically 23 hours a day inside their cell. So kind of reverting back to that first main system that was here, but not for the same reasons by any means. Right, more just punishment and isolation. Exactly. This is a purely punishment block. It's already darker in here. There are not skylights in here. The cells themselves are by far much smaller. They only have room for a bed and a toilet with a sink on top of it. These inmates would have been given no privacy whatsoever. And like I said, 23 hours a day inside their cells. 
And built in the 50s, built in the uh, after the decision. Yeah, so. 1959 is when it starts to be actively used. Mm-hmm. But this block is, I think, is a really, really great way to see how the ideals of Eastern State have done an entire 180. This, if the founders knew that this was on the property, they would probably totally disagree with it, just because this goes against everything that they wanted to accomplish while a person was in prison. Yeah, this is basically removing an offender from society to protect society and to punish the individual, and and that's that. There's no rehabilitative element to it. Exactly, exactly. In 1961, one inmate ends up getting his hands on a key ring and letting all the other inmates out. So that was kind of the beginning of the end of Eastern State. The state is very keeping a very close eye on this building. The whole thing is made of stone, so they're already putting a lot of money into it for maintenance. So after that riot, they were saying if, if we wanted to modernize this building and make sure everything was safe and secure, they would have to do a huge overhaul of it. And the building itself is just too obsolete. So after that point, it does take a little while to phase this building out. But by 1970 is when the state pulls its funding. Do they actually shut it down and it lies fallow for 20 something years? Kind of. They, they shut it down 19. Well, they pull their funding 1970. They try using it as an overflow jail for about a year. Fails miserably. Uh, the problem still exists. The building is still too obsolete and Philadelphia is right next door. So 1971 on the books is when the, they start transferring inmates out and this place is totally abandoned. But the city of Philadelphia wanted nothing to do with it. So they didn't take care of it. So it fell apart. They wanted private investors to come in to buy this building. So if you come over here, you can see the blueprints of a shopping mall that they wanted to build here. Eastern State Penitentiary, the shopping mall. My personal favorite is luxury condominiums inside a gated community. A little too gated for a lot of people's liking. So those ideas really didn't work out either. Right. Seemed like a good idea at the time. Yeah. But this is also a photo of what the building looked like. There are trees growing absolutely everywhere. So today the building is known as a stabilized ruin. It is safe for us to be in, but it's a very slow process of like making sure everything is open and accessible to the public. Yeah. In fact, I mentioned Ellis Island earlier. This reminds me a lot of Ellis Island in the same sense that they shut it down there, in that case in the 50s. And there were trees everywhere and it, you know, the roofs caved in, the pigeons and rats moved in. And much of it is now what, you know, that stabilized ruin, which is sort of holding things, cleaning it up and stabilizing it. But and then with an eye towards eventually doing something with it or at least bringing them back and in some incorporating them into the museum. Absolutely. One of um, Eastern State's mission statements, or part of the mission statement, is to make the building safe and accessible for visitors to come in and learn about the history of the building. Another part of Eastern State's mission statement is to connect the past to the present, to talk about contemporary things, talking about a lot of the things that the founders of Eastern State were talking about when they created this building, like what should happen to, to a person when they commit a crime, what should prisons look like, is still being discussed today. So that's why we talk about contemporary issues as well. It's a great way, especially, I want to say for school kids, especially when they graduate and learn about the world that we live in today, especially the country we live in, to create a connection from this very old building to what's going on today and how all of this is very fluid and relevant. Yeah, it's important. History should uh, always be interesting, but also always, to the extent that it's possible, relevant. All right, Lauren, thank you very much. You're welcome. Lauren Bennett is a tour guide at the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Well, I hope you have a chance to visit Eastern State Penitentiary someday. It's a fascinating place with an important story to tell. If you want to see what it looks like, I've posted a lot of photographs from my tour on our website, inthepastlane.com. And one more thing. What really makes Eastern State Penitentiary compelling today is a new on-site exhibit. It's called Prisons Today, and it lays out in vivid detail the story of mass incarceration since 1970. The most startling feature of the exhibit sits out on the old baseball field. It's a massive bar graph that shows the explosion of the U.S. prison population since 1970. It also includes stats that compare incarceration rates in the U.S. with other countries in the world. I've included several photographs at our website, inthepastlane.com. There's no better way to learn why the United States took this turn in the 1970s than to speak with historian Elizabeth Hinton, author of From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America. Elizabeth will talk to us in our next episode, part two of our deep dive into the history of prisons and criminal justice in American history. I hope you'll join us for this really important conversation. Because, as we always say here at In the Past Lane, history is about the past, but it's also about here and now. That's why history is so important. That's why history matters. All 
right, people. That's going to do it for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thanks for listening. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions, I'd love to hear from you. Send them my way via Twitter and Facebook. If you want to learn more about the things we've talked about in this episode, head over to our website, inthepastlane.com. There you can also learn more about the people behind this podcast, like Jay Graham, who created our intro music. And if you'd like to help the In the Past Lane podcast, please go to iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you access this podcast and leave a starred review. Reviews really help bring in new listeners. So thanks. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, you get the last word. People want to know, what do you like best about history? Everyone's dead. SBI, Snoring Beagle International. (laughs) 